morning, church. Our scripture reading today is Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their positions and property and distributed the proceeds to all, as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God. Hi, my name is Shia, my last name is Lehong. Uh, and I've got the privilege of sharing the message of God with uh, you all this morning. And I'm wondering where should I start? I figured, let me just try and write something a bit so that uh, when I stand here, I can say something that maybe will make you think that I'm a kind of nice person, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I wrote a small piece, and I'm going to try and read it out. Um, it, it goes hand in hand with what I believe uh, God wants us to hear uh, this morning. It is titled, A Voice in the Wilderness. It goes like, Here I stand, solitude as my sole companion, interrupted by the stillness of stillness, voice nudging and calming my innermost turmoil, calling me to a purpose bigger than I could ever imagine. I hear a voice calling in the wilderness. My children are held captives. Whom shall I send? Without hesitation, I say, Here I am, Lord, send me. From the stillness, I hear a multitude of voices crying out still, Here I am, Lord, send me. Still the voice in the wilderness cries out, My children are held captives. Whom shall I send? Again I shout, send me, Lord, I am ready. Suddenly I am called into introspection and the weight of my words lacks mass. Put into the fire, ashes form, clearly gold my words never wear. Like flowers scorched in the desert, my utterances withered into nothingness. For no truer thoughts traversed my sinful lips. I profess surrender, yet hoard mammon. I speak of change, yet clutch to my old self. For my lips and heart are universally unhinged. What can I hide from thee, O Lord, when I am cellularly acquainted to thine sight? Lord, I am unworthy, yet you know me by name. Shame has been my garment, yet you clothed me with glory. Still I hear you call, my children are held captives, whom shall I send? I'm not ready, Lord, but I'm available. Amen. 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 I am not ready, Lord, but I'm available. Now, we have been going through a series, and you have noticed if you've been here for a while, uh, that um, we've been reading the same scripture for almost two months now, and preaching from the same scripture from about two months now. This shows the vast and the beauty of our Lord and Savior. And from the same scripture, many messages can emerge. From the same words, many lives can be touched in a different way. This morning, we are going to be talking about commitment or participating in ministry committing to participate in ministry. I went through uh, a dictionary to try to find out what does com the word commitment mean. Well, the Oxford Dictionary says that the word commitment means the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause or an activity and so forth. That is what the word commitment means. Now, before we go any further also, allow me to start by 
mapping out where we are going and what we will be talking about this morning, what I titled the roadmap of this particular morning. These are the three things that I want us to, to have a conversation about. Is it important to commit and participate in church activities? Number two, reasons to belong. Number three, show up and commit. Show up and commit. Before we go further, let me please allow me to, to open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, there is none like you, O oh Father God. Here we stand, O oh Father God, many thoughts going through our minds, O oh Father God. For many of us, O oh Father God, we say if we hear your voice calling unto us, we will surrender everything and come after you. Some of us don't even understand the cost of following you, O oh Father. But I come to you this morning, O oh Father God, as I speak to our hearts, O oh Lord, as we surrender, O oh Father God, taking cognizance, O oh Father God, of our mortal, sinful nature, but still saying, O oh Father God, if you are to call to us, here we are availing ourselves, O oh Father God, for your glory, Lord. And here I stand this morning, O oh Father God, not taking lightly the opportunity that you have given unto me to stand before your children, O oh Father God. I stand here, Father God, and I open up myself to say, Lord, here I am, speak. Here are your children, O oh Father God, hungry to hear from you, O oh Father God, speak. Speak to their hearts, O oh Father God, I pray, O oh Father God, that even if as I speak, that you continue, O oh Father God, to minister to your children's hearts, O oh Father God. That even their words that I do not say, O oh Father God, still you can speak to their hearts and they hear you, O oh Father God, and they hear your heart, O oh Father God. For I am, O oh Father God, but a vessel awaiting to be, to be utilized by you, O oh Father God. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we bring glory, honor to your name. Amen. 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 Now, as I said, that we'll be talking about uh, participating, committing to participating in ministry. But first of all, let's start with describing or defining what is covenant a commitment. Now, this is an opportunity that we give to each and every one of us I don't say each and every one of you because I am included as well. To each and every one of us to commit to the vision of Fellowship City. To do what? To commit to a vision. And to participate in the ministry of Fellowship City. Um, in specific ways for the next 12 months. I was thinking about it as I was preparing. I say, but why, why 12 months? I mean, I thought, you know, we, we in this for life. And you're telling me 12 months, are we giving me like a, a way out? But hey, we are saying, the journey, they say that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a, st a single step. Let's start. That is what we are saying. 12 months, let's start. And we will take it from there. Let's start. We are talking about, there, are, there, there have been several... Um, uh, uh, commitment uh, spaces that we have uh, preached about. And this morning, we are talking about the second one. Uh, we are talking about participation in the ministry, discipleship, and fellowship uh, spaces of Fellowship City. This is where we are inviting you to. This is what we are inviting you to commit yourself to. This is what we are inviting you to commit yourself to. Now, you've also find this in our discipleship journey. You, we have spoken about our disciples journey for, discipleship journey for a while. And on the triangle, you will see them commit faithfully to transformation, to God's people, and to the mission of the church. So this morning, we'll be looking more on God's people and the mission of the church. That is what we are inviting you to commit to. That is what we are inviting you to commit to. Not only that, but let me enunciate our vision as a church. What is it that we want to see? Well, our vision is seeing God's kingdom come by transformed lives in and through his transcultural church. We want to see the transformation of individual lives. Do you want to be part of that? If you do, here's an open invitation for you. 
here's an open invitation for you. You see, commitment is an interesting concept, an extremely interesting concept. People can be committed to stock fails, you know. You can commit to going to gym on a daily basis. You can commit to eating healthy, you know, uh, living a healthy health, uh, lifestyle, you know, bicycle riding. You can even commit to playing golf, right? And you give your commitment and you see the changes. The commitment builds forth your ch you know, a change. You become, you become very good in whatever you're committed to. You become very good in whatever aspect and area of your life you choose to commit to. Some even also commit to their uh, careers. They see themselves through their careers. They do whatever they do based on the aspect of where they stand in their careers. That commit well, that also is because obviously for you to be able to succeed in your career, you have to give something. You have to be committed to being good at what you do. That is what committed commitment requires. That is what commitment requires. But committing to a church, well, that's something different. That's a whole new ball game. Committing to a church is a whole new game. It can be a very sensitive topic. For people who do go to church, some are members, while others prefer to sleep in just before the word is preached and out just after the word is preached. Others would rather not commit to a church, but instead hop from one to the other. We have a phrase, I don't know if you guys know it, but it says, church head hurts more than anything else. Church head is the worst. If you have been hurt in a church, that is the worst kind of pain that you can ever experience. And wh why is that though? Well, that is because we know God, or we know of God, or we have been told about God. We have been told of how good God is. We have been told of how loving God is. And when I go to church, I expect the same kind of love. I expect the same kind of embrace. I expect the same. I expect the character of God. What happens when I don't see that in the church? What happens when, when I don't see that character? When I, when I, oh, the only thing that I see is people willing to take advantage of me. And you still expect me to commit to a church? You still expect me to commit to a church? How can I trust any church when someone I consider a brother or sister in Christ has hurt me? in an unimaginable way. It could be that some among us have been abused in church. It could be that we have been emotionally, sexually, physically, and even financially abused by the church. And now being told that I need to commit to a church is too much. It's too much. I cannot commit to people that hurt me so much. The victim of abuse find it hard to trust anyone in the church because many times the church failed to respond appropriately to their hurts. There are individuals who love God but they want nothing to do with the church. And we cannot blame them because of the pain that they have been put through. I've got a friend of mine. Uh, last year he stopped going to church. The reason why he stopped going to church was because when, when did uh, iPhone 15 come out? Yeah, when the iPhone 15 came out, he bought one for his wife. The following month, they went on a week-long vacation in Cape Town. And they were posting all the beautiful things they were doing. And when they came back, the pastor called him and said, I see you are succeeding, but I do not see the money coming into the church. I do not see your tithe. I do not see your offering. And that kicked him out of the church. He stopped going to church because of that. 
And when we had a conversation about all these things, and I said to him, I know that you could have been hurt, you have been hurt by this church. But my encouragement to you is don't stop going to church. It may not necessarily be that church, but don't stop going to church. The moment you say, I'm taking a break from going to church, you get used to being outside of the covering of a church, and then everything, you know, it doesn't make sense now to, go, to start going to church. It doesn't make sense now to commit to any other body. Now, what do I do, though, when I've been hurt by the church? What does the Bible say about it? Well, all that I can say to you, the encouragement that I can give, is found in Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. The Bible says, look at verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe. Awe for what? Not awe for one another, but awe for what God has been doing, what they were seeing God do. It filled them with awe. Like, wow. This God. This God. I see him do whatever he's doing. They were filled with awe. When you have been hurt by the church and feel like not going to church anymore, take your focus from people in the church. Take your focus to God. See him. Let him be the one that fills you with awe. Let him be the one that surprises you with how loving he is. Let him be the one that embraces you, cover you with his loving arms. Feel his love. Feel his kindness. Feel his spirit move. You see, sometimes we get hurt so much so in the church because we put too much of emphasis on individuals. Our focus starts being on people, on the pastor, and not on God. The moment we move our focus from God to people, we're opening ourselves up to unimaginable pain. Everyone was filled with awe not because of what the disciples were making or doing or the, the signs they were performing, but because they were performing them because of God. When we focus our attention to God and to God alone, all the pain and all the hurts melts away because he embraces us. He restores us. So when you have been hurt and don't feel like going to church anymore, don't focus on church. Focus on God. Focus on God. Now verse 44 says the believers were together. Here's another thing. When you focus on God, you don't let everybody else out. When you focus on God, still look, at the, look for people who f- are focusing on God as well. And together we focus on God. Together we focus on God alone. It doesn't mean that these people may may not hurt us in the future. But the focus is on God. The focus is not on individuals. The focus is on God. The focus remains on God. And they held everything, they held all things in common, as it goes goes on to say in, in verse 44. What was their common goal? God. What is your common goal? Jesus. That is what I'm saying. Let us take our focus to Jesus. Even in the midst of pain, we're not discounting the pain. The pain may be there, but we're saying focus. Focus. Have a vision tunnel just for God. Just for God. And in verse 46 it says that every day they devoted themselves to meeting together. You see, it goes on to also say that as much as I am focusing on God, I must also make sure that the brother that I'm working with is focusing on God. And how can I do that? I can do that by working together with him. For us imploring each other. For us provoking each other into loving God, loving others as well. They broke bread together and they met from house to house. They don't only meet on Sunday. They create a relationship 
A relationship that when things are not going well in my life, you will be able to know because you and I are like this. We don't only see each other on Sundays and say, oh, how have you been? How was your week? We got to create a relationship that goes beyond Sundays. Because we don't serve a God of a Sunday only. Right? We don't love each other only on Sunday. We're not called to love each other only on a particular day. We are called to love one another. And like I'm saying, it doesn't mean simply because we are in church and we love God together, there may not necessarily be a dispute arising amongst us. But the focus still must remain on Jesus. We also look at the book of Hebrew, Hebrews 10, from verse 22 to 25. It, it goes like, Let us draw nearer with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting together, together, as some are in the habits of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. That is what the writers of Hebrews are saying. See, the writer of Hebrew, he says that our hearts, our hearts must be truly assured of this hope, of this hope that he who promised is faithful. That he who promised is faithful. The writer of Hebrews is encouraging believers to assemble together because many were in the habits of neglecting to meet each other. We are saying, I am a Christian and I will worship God on my own. But there is something different that you get when you worship with other fellow believers. When you fellowship with like-minded individuals. The Bible says, where two or more are gathered, there in their midst there will be. Yes, when I am alone, I can pray to God, I can commune with him. But How much more when I know and I am certain that he will be there because there will be more than two. Two or more will be there. I am certain that he will be there. I know, I know that I know that he will be there. That I will have an encounter with him. Why would I run away from that? I would want to fellowship I would want to be in a place where I know that God is. And you get that when you fellowship with like-minded believers. When you fellowship in their midst. You get that when you fellowship in a church. When you fellowship with people who believe in what you believe in. Now, whether the reasons, uh, uh, whatever the reasons, whatever their reasons, rather, the writers of Hebrews implored them to come back to their first love, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to neglect the distraction around them. For that reason, being a part of a church community is essential to the life of a believer. Similarly, I believe having close fellowship with other believers provides accountability. And it also provides you with an opportunity to have someone that can walk with you. To have a pastor that can can, can guide you in a spiritual walk. It it provides you with an opportunity to have somebody that you can keep accountable and that can keep you accountable. That is some of the benefits of being committed to a Christian community. That is some of the examples of being committed in a Christian community. Now, if we can agree from what has been said that it is essential to be part of a Christian family, 
then why is it sometimes so difficult to commit? Why is it so difficult to commit? Most of the time it's because our focus are not on the right aspects. Our focus is not on God but on people. And I would continue to say this and say this again. Once we remove our focus from God, we open ourselves heart up to being hurt. But once we put our focus on God, even if storms come and rage around us, but we know that he embraces us. He holds us together. He holds us together. Now allow me to give some four reasons as to why I believe it is important to belong to a church family. There are four reasons that I have in mind. The church is a refuge. The church strengthens people. The church is where you can live out your purpose. And the church is where you can make an eternal difference. Let's start with the first one and expand a bit on it. The church is a refuge. Now, life can be hard. Every now and then we need a place for a soft landing to recharge, to rest, to be encouraged, and to be motivated sometimes when, when things are not going well. When you become invested in the lives of, of a group of people and allow them to see the real you, to comfort you, to love you, friendship will follow. When they see you, when they know you, friendship will follow then you will have a place to hide. You will have a refuge. You will have people who will be able to cover you when you're feeling cold. The church is a spiritual family. As can be seen in 1 John 3 verse 1, which says, See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. But we are God's children. And if we are God's children, then let us show forth the light of God. From the time we are born, we crave to be connected. In fact, it is the only way to thrive. Even when our biological family is filled with brokenness and turmoil, the inner desire to be connected never goes away. God calls us his family. And he teaches us how to love one another. It still gets messy sometimes. But we are here because we care and want to grow in love. And then again, he himself is our refuge. He himself is our refuge. It's amazing how, how things work out. Because as, 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 as Marita was here, uh, during the cellar, quoting Psalm 91. It is the same Psalm that I also have in my sermon. You know, Psalm 91, verse 1 to 4. It says, The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. Under the shadow of the Almighty. He is our refuge. And I will say, Concerning the Lord, who is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he himself will rescue you from the bed trap, from the destructive plague. He will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. Even in the midst of our heads, he himself remains our refuge. Run to him. Hide under the shadow of his wings. He will cover you. He will embrace you. You are loved. You are loved. Pursued endlessly. Because of who you are. Because he loves you. He pursues you. 
to the ends of the earth. I don't know, guys, if you if you've ever been been in a place where there is something going on in you and all you need is just to be comforted and, and somebody just comes and gives you a warm embrace, a warm hug, a hug that says, it's going to be okay. We can get that also in human beings. I remember when we were, uh, uh, we had rooted, we had uh, Ingrid. Uh, no, no, not Ingrid, Erica. Her hugs were the best. Her, her hugs were the best. I, I used to look forward to, to seeing her on Sunday, knowing that she's going to give me that warm, motherly hug. The hug that gives you and you say, ah, I am at peace. Whenever I saw her on, a, on, on Wednesday in city groups and on Sundays, I looked forward to that hug. And in here, I always look forward to, to Leon and and, and Josie's hugs, they are the best. They don't give you those, you know, HR. No. They are the hugs that says, come, let me embrace you. Come, let me feel you. They are the hugs that says, as I hold you, I can feel your heartbeat. And I want you to know that you are safe. That is what you get in a church community. People who will love you, not because... They want something from you. People who will embrace you, not because here there's something that they desire from you, but people who will embrace you, love you, because you are you. You get that in a church community. You get that in a church community with people who will truly care about you, genuinely. I don't know if you guys have seen there's a hug that I love. Oh, man. Always whenever I see it, I'm like, yeah. That's it. The hug between Reino and Franz. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen it. It is not just, you know, these hugs and yeah. They've got their own special kind of hug. You know, they hug each other. They pet each other at the back. They pet each other on the bums. They, you know, it is a hug that says, brother, I love you. Brother, I missed you. You get that when you have built a relationship with like-minded people. People who are inspired by God, people who are loved by God, and people who are saying, that love that I have received from God, I want you to feel it. You cannot get that when you are worshiping alone in your own house. You get that amongst brethren. You get that amongst brethren. Now the church strengthens people. Point number two. Nobody is a solo Christian. Jesus told a parable of the lost sheep in Luke 15, 3 to 6. And a good shepherd who went looking until he found that one lost sheep. He left. He could leave secured knowing that the rest of the sheep were together knowing that they would take care of each other, knowing that they would strengthen each other, then he could go and look for that one lost sheep. Are you one of those that he can entrust his children, his people to? That if I walk out, I know, I know that my children will be safe simply because you are here. My children will be safe because there is a brother who will love them the way that I would love them. Are we one of those? Do we take the responsibility of loving the people around us with the love that Christ requires from us? Are we taking the responsibility of showing the kind of love that Christ has for us and are we just only keeping it to ourselves? We are called to love and to show love and to strengthen those that are weak among us. There's a song, Lean on me and I'll be your strength. When you're weak, 
I will strengthen you. Are you someone's pillar of strength? If somebody in here comes to you and just tells you of whatever they're going through, the trials and tribulations they're facing, and you are in a position to be a pillar and alleviate some, if not all, but some, will you say, I will pray for you? Or will you rise up and meet that need that you can meet? It is incumbent upon us. We've got a responsibility. We are called not only to preach the word, but to be the word in real form. To, people have to, to feel the word alive through us. Can somebody come here and say, I know God lives because I have seen you. Can you be that pillar? That strength that somebody else needs. That strength that somebody else needs. Now don't rob me of the opportunity of loving you. And don't rob me of the opportunity of being loved by you. Let go. Let me love you. Oh, another one comes to mind. Oh, you should let me love you. Ah, uh, you should be. The, you should let me be the one to take care of you. Uh, let me be the one that meet all your needs, because Christ met my needs. You should let me love you, for I am open to being loved by you. Don't rob me of the opportunity to being of being loved by you, and of loving you. Now, the church is where you can live out your purpose. God calls us his body, the body of Christ. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12, from verse 14 to 20. Indeed, the body, indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the food should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But it is. But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there is many parts, but one body. Which part of the body are you? Which part of the body are you? And are you playing your role? Are you playing it perfectly? How would you know which part of the body you are if you are not in the body? You have to come into the body to find out which part of the body you are and be able to optimally meet your function. And where do you get that? You get that in the church body. You can live out the purpose that you've been called for. You can live out the purpose that you've been called for. In the field of music, a symphony, very many, I don't know if that's a, even a proper English word, but nonetheless, <laughs> there are many parts, many instruments playing their own role. Not one time pretending to be the other, each part have their own role. But brought together, matched together, it is like heaven on earth. The symphony, it is like heaven on earth. It is like heaven on earth. God has given each of us special characteristics, talents, and interests that fill the purpose and create the beauty when we use them in harmony with other believers. 
when we use them in harmony with other believers. When you are a lone Christian, you cannot be able to live out your purpose. You can understand and know your purpose when you are in the vicinity of other believers. Then you can know where your part is and which part to play. There's a quote here by Mitch Albon that talks specifically about that. The way you get meaning into your life is to devote yourself to loving others. Devote yourself to your community, to the community, to your community around you. And devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. You find that in loving others and being loved by others. If you don't know which part you can play, you can go to uh, our YouTube channel. You'll see on the 26th of May, Reno preached a sermon about saving through your talents. Just go through that and then you'll be able to understand where you can meet up, where you can pitch up. Now the church is where you can live your eternal uh, difference. Where you can live, where you can make an eternal difference. We are on a mission together to lead others to receiving Christ, to receiving forgiveness, the restoration and reconciliation. When Jesus sent out the 12 disciples and later the 72, he sent them in pairs because two is better than one. There's a saying that says, if you want to go far, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go, far, if you want to go further, go with someone else. We are not in the spirit of, or in the business, or yeah, we're not in the spirit of going fast. We are going far. That is why we need each and every one of us to work together, to walk together. Seeing someone receive Christ as uh, the Lord and Savior is one of the greatest joy and experience. In the book of Acts, we read about unbelievers becoming saved by seeing Christians doing life together by seeing Christians loving one another. People seeing you loving someone else in the church and saying, I want to be loved like that. I want to love like that. Uh, gets me wondering, if somebody was to look at me or to look at you, would they say, I want what that particular person has? Sure. When they look at you, would they say, I want to have that which he has, that which he has. Now, covenant commitment is an opportunity to say yes to being in the church that Jesus wants us to be. With that being said, it is important also to ensure that when you want to commit to a community, uh, to a church community, you, you, you understand what they stand for. You understand what makes them tick. You understand and you agree with, 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 with whatever vision that they, they, they do have. When, when I first got uh, into a relationship, and about 12 years ago when I got married, I said to my wife, there needs to be something that defines us. Something that says this is what the lease stands for. And we drafted what I call the Lee Creed. In my family, this is what we say about ourselves. We love God. We love one another. We love others. And we are generous. That is what my household says about itself. If you come to our household and you do not experience any of this, then we are lying to ourselves then we are lying about who we say we are. Similarly, in this church, we say we are about three things. We tell ourselves this and remind ourselves these three things every single Sunday. We say we are gospel-centered, we are disciple-making, and transcultural. That is what we say. And when we say we are gospel-centered, we are essentially saying, hey, by the way, we 
are at Jesus' church. Right? Everything else might what, 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 but we, at the core of it, we are at Jesus' church. If you are not into Jesus, then when you come here, you might be in the wrong place because we are a Jesus church and are not going to compromise that. That is who we are. We are gospel-centered. Every single thing we do revolves around Jesus. It is about him. We believe in the perfect life. We believe in the perfect life, birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and the return of Jesus Christ. And we affirm him as our Lord and Savior. That is who we are. We also are disciple making. We listen to him. We listen to what he said we should do. We are saying we have received his love. We don't, we don't want to hold it to ourselves. But we want to see that love going to others. We believe that because the gospel has transformed us we want to see that multiplying effect into other individuals. We are calling them to him, not to ourselves. And also, we are saying we are transcultural. <laughs> what do you mean? By, I was thinking about this earlier this morning, and I was like, we are saying, we are not saying, when we are saying we are transcultural, we are not saying we want Reino to stand in the sun and, and turn so that he can look like me. Okay, And we are also not saying that I should not start taking any uh, pigmentation, uh, changing uh, medication so that I can look like him. We are saying just as he is, we want to send him to God. Just as I am, I want to worship God. Just as you are, we don't want to change you to be something that you are not. Come as you are and together let's go and we worship God. Transcultural. That is what we are saying. Amen. Come as you are. We, we, we are not saying that we don't see skin color, as some are in the habit of saying. We see you just as you are. We accept you just as you are. We are saying, let's walk together just as you are. For what? The glory of God. That is what we are calling. That is what we are. So if this, that which I've just said, is something that you can jol with, then let's jol together. <laughs> then let's jol together. That is why we say, show up and commit. If all these that I've said are things that you can relate to, things that you can play around with, things that you can feel loved in, then show up and commit. And now, how do you participate in Fellowship City? And I just need to say this now. This is not a sales pitch. Right? If it is a sales pitch, it is a sales pitch to God, not to Fellowship City. I am calling each and every one of us to pay our attention and our focus, not to Fellowship City, but to God. Because he is the one that called us. Right? If I am pointing you to something else that is not God, then I am not being truthful and faithful to the word. I have to point us to Jesus, in whom we have our life and our being in whom we have our life and our being. With that being said, at Fellowship City, we have several uh, ministries that you can participate in. We create spaces for each of us to encounter God deeply. When you, when you say, I am signing up to the covenant commitment, you are saying, I am availing myself to be the right person at the right place, at the right time. These are the spaces that we have. When you're saying, I am in, you are saying, I am in to coming as often as possible to the Sunday service fellowship. We are saying, when there are encounter weekends, I am going to make sure that I make time for that. You, you get to experience God in a different way in this, in this, in this circumstance. 
in this, in this encounter, we can, those that have been there will tell you of how God works and how God moves. A, a brother of mine was saying that during our last encounter weekend, he put up a test to God, for lack of a better term, to say, God, if you really are here, then let this one, two, three happen. He will tell you on his right time. In fact, he's not here now. When he comes back, you must ask him about the test that he gave to God. Francois will tell you. He told God that if indeed you are here, let one, two, three, four happen. And it happened exactly as he said. God moves when we create these spaces. Say yes to them. Encounter worship. It is a worship filled with, you feel as if you are in heaven, yet you are still on earth. That is what we are calling you to. And that is what you are saying yes to. To discipleship group. To city group. You are saying I am committing to showing up for Sunday services. You are saying I am availing, um, I'm available to showing up to encounter weekends. To encountering God during encounter weekend and encounter worship. That is what you are saying. Now in conclusion, let me say this. When we say all that we said and you choose not to sign up for the covenant commitment, it doesn't mean we are going to say to you, you are no longer part of us that we are not going to love you simply because you decided not to be a committed member. We are called to loving you regardless. And we vow to love you regardless. We vow to be there for you when you need us. We vow not to turn our back on you simply because you choose to join another church. I know how it feels like to have people that you have grown and built relationship with having to move to other churches. But we here, we will love you nonetheless. I'm reminded a couple of weeks ago, one of our sisters had to move to another, uh, to move uh, for work, I think to Joburg. We didn't say simply because now she's not going to be fellowshipping with us, then that's it. The leaders in this church are the ones who helped her move. Got a trailer, packed her things, and helped her move. Assisted her in finding a family that will love her. A church family that will love her. Even if you decide not to be part of this church, we will and we are vowing to love you wherever you are. When you need us, just call on us. There's another song that comes to mind. I'm only one call away. <laughs> Just one call away. That is what we are. We are just one call away. Whether you are here or not, when you are in need, we will be that Christ in the flesh for you. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here we are again, opening ourselves up, O oh Father God, to receiving your love that we may share it, that we may not hoard it, O oh Father God, but that your children may see you through us, that your light, O oh Father God, may shine through us, that we may continue to be the salt of the earth, that those, oh Father God, that do not know us, oh Father God, still they can look at us and say, I want that which that brother has. I want that which that sister has. I want to love like he loves. I want to embrace like he embraces. I want that peace. Lord God, we are availing ourselves. We may not be worthy, oh Father God, but we are available to be used by you, Jesus. To be loved by you, Jesus to love like you, Jesus, or to care like you care, Jesus Christ. Lord, we come to you. Lord, we give ourselves just for you, Lord. 
Have your way in us, Jesus. I will pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.